Every summer since the end of the Second World War, cadets from across the country have come to Camp Ipperwash on Lake Huron to see for themselves if there really is no life like it. The six weeks here are a first taste of the military for these boys and girls. 1,000 youngsters now playing soldier on a base built to train the men who fought World War II. The cadet's commanding officer, Colonel Ralph West. This camp, quite frankly, is the Cadillac of cadet camps. It's the best cadet camp in the country. You wouldn't want to lose it. No way. Before the war, the land that is now Camp Ipperwash was the Stony Point Indian Reserve, home to 18 Chippewa families. Today, the former occupants live with a neighboring Indian band at Kettle Point. It was 47 years ago that the Canadian government took the Indians' land to build an army base and trucked their houses five kilometers down the road to Kettle Point. About 130 people were uprooted and moved, among them a little boy then known as Nobby. Today, Nobby is better known as Bob George, proprietor of the Kettle Point gas station and grocery store. I've got quite a lot to tell you about that day. Uh... Who do you see there? <laughs> I see a scared little little boy, really. How old were you? Oh, geez, what? Ten? Eight? Ten? Under there somewhere? Who, who are you carrying? It, uh, I thought it was my sister at first, but I think it's my niece. I remember back in that time when they told me that when the war was over, we were going to get our home back. That must be one hell of a long war because I haven't got my home back yet. It was wartime. The Department of National Defense needed places to train recruits. It expropriated land across the country, and in southwestern Ontario, it found what it wanted about 100 kilometers northwest of London. It was during the third year of the war that the federal government had a proposition for the Indians at Stony Point. It had been decided that a military training facility was necessary in this part of Ontario, and that this would be the best place to build it. So the government offered the Indians $50,000 to move with the promise that when the Department of National Defense no longer needed the land, it would be returned to them. The Indians voted on the offer and turned it down. So the government ignored the vote, invoked the War Measures Act, and took the land anyway. The Indian Reserve was transformed into the A-29 Canadian Infantry Corps Training Center. It could accommodate 2,000 soldiers at a time, mostly for three-month courses in weapons training, learning the intricacies of such devices as the Bren machine gun. The Indian's former home, 2,240 acres of field, swamp, and bush, was ideal terrain to prepare the foot soldiers they called the grunts. By the time the war ended in 1945, 30,000 men had come through Camp Ipperwash. But when the fighting stopped, the government of Mackenzie King did not return the land to the Stony Point Indians as they believed it would. The band thought there would be negotiations, that the 1942 order in council was very specific. It said the expropriation was a matter of military expediency, that once the land was no longer acquired, the Indians could buy it back at a reasonable price. In May 1946, in a letter to Indian Affairs, the Department of National Defense admitted that, quote, to continue ownership of the land into the post-war period would be unjust to the Indians. That is you. Yes, that is me in England. And I imagine that I Back in 1941, Clifford George was the first man on the Stony Point Reserve to enlist in the Army. He and his artillery detachment would serve along Europe's front lines. I think it was 1943 that we shot our first plane down. 
Did I, word I, of that get home? Did the people at Stony uh, Point hear about a, that? There, there was a there was a, a young fella come back on on officers training, and he was from around Godrich Way, and he put in the paper that the George boys got shot the first plane down. So you made headlines back home. And back home. Bombardier George was with Canada's 3rd Division, manning anti-aircraft guns in England. He took part in the fierce battles near Falaise in France. He was wounded by shrapnel at Cannes, where 1,500 Canadians were killed or injured. George fought on into Italy, where he was finally taken prisoner for the last three months of the war. Italy, Italy star. Well, that's little grim uh, when they read out uh, from the cenotaph, they read, they read off the names of the people that never come back. It hits you. And how lucky that I am that I come back. But rather than a hero's welcome, what George found when he returned home was that home no longer existed. The houses, the school, and the church at Stony Point had all been replaced by army barracks. I had, I had visions of having, uh, having my own piece of land when I got back. Instead, when you got home after the war, what was the situation that you found? Nowhere to go. Housing was, uh, housing was absolutely nil, and, and, uh, and uh, there was no place to go in Cattle Point. There was no housing, no nothing. There was, uh, so I, I just, uh, I stayed in the, in the town of Forest and finally got a little wee, uh, just a little shack half a shack to live in, and, and uh, that's about uh, the extent of it. There was no place to move whatsoever. In 1949, George got a job at Camp Iberwash as a janitor. He lived in the barracks for a year. No longer a resident of the reserve, he lost his Indian status. The camp remained virtually deserted until the Korean War. These were the last real fighting men at Ipperwash, the 4th Battalion of the Canadian Guards, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Strom Galloway. But in 1957, his 450 soldiers boarded buses and the battalion disbanded. Five years after that, another unit trained here for NATO duties in Germany. Since they pulled out 27 years ago, Camp Ipperwash has been left mostly to summer cadets and weekend soldiers. But at the Department of National Defense in Ottawa, Chief Real Estate Agent John Hill insists that Canada still needs Camp Ipperwash. We are training troops all over Canada, including Ipperwash, for our peacekeeping missions. We have troops in Cyprus. We have them in uh, the Golan Heights. We've sent them to Iran, Iraq. Now the government's talking about a peacekeeping force, possibly for Nicaragua. Come on, let's go, let's go. But peacekeepers on the Golan Heights and along the Iran-Iraq border didn't train for the job at Camp Ipperwash, nor did the two Canadians on duty in Nicaragua. This past July, there was some training here for peacekeepers going to Cyprus, one day of it during which they learned how to drive on the left-hand side of the road. That leaves one regular army unit and nine local militia units who come to use the firing range mostly on weekends. Oh, there goes the knee on and off, for four decades after the war, the Indians talked to the Defense Department about their land. Finally, in 1980, the government made a proposal. Representatives of the Departments of Indian Affairs and National Defense came to this ballpark at Kettle Point. They made their best offer, a compensation package worth more than two and a half million dollars, and a promise the Indians had heard before, that if the land were no longer needed for military purposes, it would be returned to the band. Once again, there was a vote. But this time, the Indians voted to accept. The deal meant $1,000 compensation for every man, woman, and child on the reserve, $700 to people like Clifford George who'd moved away, and a million dollar trust fund for the band. But as far as Chief Bonnie Brissett is concerned, the land still belongs to the Indians. Department of National Defense at the meeting and we had a number of meetings with them and the Minister of Indian Affairs, clearly spelled out to the band by accepting this money that it was not a surrender of the land, that it was a compensation that was due them in 1942. I think it's a hell of a deal. If I buy your house and I say to you, Bob, that when 
I die or I have to go to the hospital or I don't, can no longer use it as a residence, I'll give it back to you free and clear regardless of what it's worth then. Mr. Hill, if you buy my house from me, it's because I choose to sell it to you. Under these circumstances, that's not the case. This land's being taken away. That's correct. In the order and cancel of 1981, which summarizes your agreement, there's no reference to the word sale or surrender. We don't have to. We already owned it. We weren't buying it back again. We had owned it since 1942. Yeah, but, but if you look at the War Measures Act, under which the land was taken in the first place, there's a limitation here, and that is that the provisions of the act under which it was taken shall only be in force during war invasion or insurrection, real or apprehended. Well, those conditions clearly ceased to exist in 1945. If there was a wrong done, I feel I've righted it. Plus, I think I've been a little more benevolent than that. I'll give them the land back when no longer required for military purposes. And I also included lands that we didn't to be, acquire. To be fair, Mr. Hill, they've had that in their agreement since 1942. To purchase it back at market value, not to get it back for a dollar. But it doesn't appear that the Indians will get the chance to spend that dollar in the near future. The government seems happy to maintain the Cadillac of cadet camps and to pay the $6.1 million it costs to keep the place open year-round. In fact, National Defense has committed another $8.5 million to improve the buildings here. Obviously, this is a time when bases are being closed in Manitoba, in Prince Edward Island, even CFB London near Ipperwash. Why, the Indians ask, are you closing bases that some people want to keep open, whereas here at Camp Ipperwash, you're keeping one open that we want to see closed? Ipperwash is a training area. It's not a base. It's a part of a base. It's a training area that's, that is used for all the local people, militia in the area. To have a base and to have militia and nowhere for them to train, it's just, it's just it's not on. It just doesn't work. No, I don't believe that is a military purpose. It's a cadet camp and a glorified army officer's campground. Everybody knows it. It may not look very military, but this four kilometer stretch of beach on Lake Huron, which is open to the public, also belongs to Camp Ipperwash. It wasn't part of the Stony Point expropriation back in 1942, but if the government ever gives Ipperwash back to the Indians, they'll get the beach as well. For now, the only indication that this is Army property are the signs warning of unexploded shells nearby. But what you find when you wander past the no trespassing signs and away from the beach isn't exactly the firing range. It's what's called the marriage patch, because after the war it was land set aside for the families of those people who worked at Camp Ipperwash. But over the past few decades, it's become something a bit different than that. A campsite and trailer park that's a retreat for soldiers, old soldiers, and their friends and families for hundreds of miles around. Kind of a military club med all summer long. Unlike the beach, this area isn't open to the public. It's for military personnel only. And a vacation here can cost as little as a dollar a day. The Indians say that if they get the land back, this is where they'll put up the theme park and the hotels. It's not a prospect that gets much sympathy from this crowd. Among them, Air Cadet Officer George Vallis. Ah, they figure, like yourself, you're not going to give away your home. And this, to us, especially like myself, it's uh, home away from home on the weekends and uh, relaxation. And hey, I'm not going to give it back to anybody, really. Not if uh, everything all bearing equal and whatnot, uh, it got paid for. The Indians say, we didn't sell that land. We didn't give it away. It was taken away. And there's a difference. How do you respond to that one? Too bad. Deal's a deal, isn't it? I sort of compare it with, uh, you hear about train wrecks. And they have, all of a sudden, for some reason or another, uh, due to chemicals or something, they have to evacuate people. Those people get evacuated knowing that sometime they're going to go home. And with us, that's the way I look at it, is we're evacuated for military purposes, but sometime we're going to go home. <laughs>